All right, there you are. Hey, Craig, thank you so much for joining. Happy Tuesday, sorry, Tuesday, the uh, macro to micro power hour for Thursday. I am obviously eager for the long weekend. This is an honor right now. I have got two guests to speak about a very hot trend. And right now, I just want to make sure that we have Craig Samuels in the room. And uh, soon, George will be able to join us by dial in. That's my hope anyway. So, Craig, can you, can you hear, hear me? me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hey, greetings. All right. So, this is really a pleasure to have you in today and for you to introduce me to George as well. Um, first, let me just kind of go through a quick little introduction. Um, I'm Samantha LaDuke, founder of LaDukeTrading.com and also CIO of Capital, LaDuke Capital LLC. Very excited to basically be able to add some uh, education and uh, maybe some really great trading themes for the upcoming year by talking about SPACs today. I entitled this SPAC attacks uh, for the sheer purpose of basically um, meeting the needs of a, a client inquiry, which was, can you get us some more info? It's just hot fire flames and we want to have um, more time to digest both as uh, traders and investors. So Craig, you are definitely the face of the um, SPAC trader. I would say you have been an investor in this space as well. And I want you to talk a little bit about your background. But for the most part, I just want to make sure that folks understood that I was doing this as a value add for sure for clients and then made it open to the public and was just thrilled to be able to kind of approach this for both trading and investment themes. Um, Craig, you're, if you want to share any charts in this convo, please feel free right now. I just wanted to make sure you can hear me and we can um, maybe get George in on the phone call as well. So it, is George live? I just spoke to him. He was trying to log in. He was looking for a link, but I told him. I see him. All right. He's here. Good. All right. We'll... <laughs> hey, George, hopefully you can hear us. Can you hear me? Oh, welcome. Yes, very much so. Great. Let me do a quick uh, in uh, intro, if you will, that I have two guest captains today, which is to approach um, both the trading and the investment horizon of these, uh, these SPACs. And two, 2020 was a huge year for them, and they haven't slowed down. If anything, they're just speeding up. Um, Craig is an equity analyst, angel investor, who's been trading and investing in SPACs since 2007, but investment management since, I think you said, 1998. Um, George is a partner and head of investment banking at Chardon in New York Writing. Uh, I think you had said the third SPAC that actually came to market way back in 2003. So talk about experts in this space. Um, I provide trader education and support. I actively trade and and support clients who do the same. And these vehicles have been obviously on the radar um, past few years, but they sped up tremendously uh, in 2020. And I wanted to be able to add some value to clients who are asking for more information and then to put together watch lists and then to do a little due diligence and find out which ones were coming to market and basically decide whether it was uh, vehicles for them they you know to trade or invest so first before um kind of getting into this and i've got some questions for the panelists and i hope you do as well feel free to tag us in in chat um i think it might help if i did a little bit of a, kind of a, a primer for those who might be interested, tip their, put their toe in the water. Maybe they, they know a lot, maybe they know very little, but uh, I sent this for clients and I will share this screen as well. Basically this definition, I just want to kind of get um, out of the way, if you will, which is what are we talking about? Um, this special purpose acquisition company or SPAC which has taken the market by storm is different from a direct listing um, IPO or a hybrid IPO. The SPAC does an IPO first when it's in 
in essence, like an empty shell, nothing, they're sell, selling no, no financials to project, which make it a little dubious for some because they don't have enough history. Um, then it goes out and finds a target company and does a merger to take that target public. And gentlemen, feel free to interrupt if I do any of that um, definition disservice. The SPAC raises money from investors to write this blank check. That's often how they're referred to and for the initial public offering and then uses the money to look for private company to merge with. It is all the rage um, because in the merger, the target company gets the money that has been raised and the SPAC shareholders get shares in the new combined company, which trade publicly. So this is the allure, if you will, of this um, space, which is new to many of us, but to Craig and George, it is not. Um, this to me is really a big um, market that uh, you've grown, basically, especially George, I know that you do the um, investment and sponsor of the SPACs, but last year, um, some 80 billion were listed in 2020. Um, this is a huge year. It turned into an epic bonanza, uh, not just for bankers and lawyers and the like, but also the companies going public as well as the investors that got in early. And this year, more than two dozen um, of these SPACs were priced just last week, raising nearly 7 billion. That comes from IPO Scoop. So a record in the number of deals and dollar volume. This is according to Renaissance Capital and SPAC Insider. This is very interesting to me. I'm, I'm really, even Thursday, I think last week, there were 14 that uh, came to market. What's going on, gentlemen? This is a, a lot of money that's being raised. And um, so far, it looks like the first week of 2021, it's more than 50% of what was raised in all of 2019. So that's a little primer, if you will, of what these are and how big they have become and their importance uh, to market participants. I would now like to kind of find out what what's going on and can this momentum continue? Craig, would you? This is Craig, me? yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll start. I just want to uh, first say thank you, Samantha, for considering me to be a guest captain. I'm uh, relatively under the radar. I've uh, started making some posts on Twitter. Um, I share a small selection of what I do on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis. Um, SPAC, I, I participated in my first SPAC. I just had a look, it's hard to believe, but it's nearly 16 years ago, uh, one of George's partners, um, Carrie Proper, uh, they began uh, doing SPACs, and George, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, at least the first one that I participated in was in China. And uh, that was 16 years ago. I filed a 13G on the 10th of uh, 2005. So the SPAC is definitely not a new product. I think it's caught fire uh, recently because interest rates are zero and bond yields looking at the 10 years, uh, 110 and the 30s, 187. And I think uh, the SPAC provides a very good alternative for institutions to reallocate capital away from bond paper and, and into the equity markets with the opportunity to, to almost have a free look at a deal. So I think recently this, this gross speculation whereby IPOs are, are always priced at 10 and they're opening at 10, 50, 11. Uh, some I think uh, are, are trading in the 14s, 15s. I, I posted earlier today that I blew out of my entire position in uh, PIPP which has not announced a deal yet. The stock was up near 16. Uh, that's a almost 60% return on, on Pine Island, 
the speculation being that uh, these guys will announce a deal. Well, they may, they may not. And if they do, there's no guarantee that it'll be 16, let alone 12 or 13, right? Everybody has to look at the deal and, and make a decision as to whether it's a good deal and the metrics look solid for sustainable future growth. Um, so are these mostly a trading vehicle for you or investment vehicle? No, no, no. Historically, they're investment vehicles. I buy a 10. I don't even look at them until there's a deal. So for instance, uh, KCAC, which became uh, QS, you know, I had high hopes for that. Uh, I like the team. So what's my strategy? I have, this is what I call my, my cheat sheet. I've literally gone through every single perspective. You have, do you want to share your screen? Oh, is it not? Is it, am I not on? Nope, not yet. No video, no sh screen share. Uh, you have no, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, oh, here I am. Hello. There you are. So here's the cheat sheet. I've got about, I don't know, 370 and, and I add 5, 10, 15, 20 of these per day. I read every single prospectus. I take notes and, and I decide which teams I'm going to run with. Okay. And the leadership. Those are my investments. And then of course the market provides opportunity and I capitalize on opportunity. And therefore some of these become trades, others become investments, but because of intraday movement, I sell them and buy them back. So I think the SoftBank deal hit 14. I sold a big chunk today at 14 and I bought most of it back in the low 13s. Okay. Again, the market gave me 6%, 7% free money. I'm going to take it. Did you have a on the 15? Sure. Did you have a piece of QS? Because that actually was the top performing SPAC of 2020, the electric vehicle charging station play quantum scape. And it was interesting because I didn't really have the same any interest as the from the investment standpoint. It was moving too quickly, right? It looked parabolic. But then I realized it has no inventory available for the shorts to even cover. So it was a recommended long just based on that market structure of that particular play. So you're looking at it from one perspective. I'm looking at it going, this thing is, you know, obviously unable to stop until it peaks and then crashes. But this particular approach, I want to kind of, as trading vehicles, a little bit later, I want to go into some of the tickers that you are, um, that you have traded this year and passionate about and bring George in also to kind of um, give some background on, you know, this, this vehicle that you have um, been part of since 2003 that has now taken off like hot fire flames. You've seen this play out from an investment standpoint, um, all your dreams fulfilled. This is just exactly what you expected. Like, where do you, where do you put all of this um, euphoria right now in this space, George? So thanks, uh, Samantha. Thanks for thanks for including me and, and Craig for uh, for connecting us. The it would be impossible for anyone who's been involved in the sector in any capacity, Craig included, who was one of the first investors um, in SPACs from from the earliest days, to to um, tell anyone credibly that they thought that this would happen. Despite that, it's happening for all the reasons that those of us who've been involved as long as we have. Um, have been advocating for it to uh, to take place. So, SPACs are different things for different stakeholders. As as Craig noted, these days to many they are uh, credit or treasury alternatives, mm -hmm. providing backstopped investment with equity optionality, which is unique in the capital markets outside of converts. Um, for um, for smaller investors. Uh, who have been driven by um, and attracted to market momentum plays all year. They were the source of a number of them. And so they can be more than just credit protected equity investments. To the sponsors of the SPACs, they're a way to uh, profit and make actionable, uh, exciting deal flow that's, that's public ready. And for the targets themselves, it's, it's a path to um, main board listing that um, has been and continues to be essentially easier, faster, and less expensive 
than a traditional IPO. Um, that brings along with it more transparency, more control, um, uh, and and a number of other uh, benefits post business combination that have been harvested by by a number of the top performers. So, in in effect, they're they're extremely flexible vehicles that serve as placeholders for different constituent interests. And it was a cottage industry up until several years ago. The total issuance volume was in the, the low 10 teens in billions. So only representing 20, 28% of the uh, total equity capital markets IPO activity in the US. And then last year, um, a confluence of events led them to be much, much more popular. Much. And I think that most, most of us who, who witnessed it firsthand, the demand to be sponsors, the demand to invest in them, the uh, the watershed moment was unfortunately the pandemic. Yeah, and and uh, equity markets reacting rationally potentially to to an unknown um, and a flight to a flight to some degree of certainty that didn't sacrifice equity exposure uh, on the upside. And and in a sense, there's only one set of vehicles that, that serves that in a, as efficient manner as facts. That, that led to, I think, a reevaluation by the street of what these vehicles had been. There had been some real successes, um, but they weren't necessarily household names. Suddenly, those successes arguably became household names um, and, and, and momentum in the sector built. And the celebrity CEO status, if you will, or the the names that led some of this charge or notoriety got a lot of attention. Um, it is about faith and leadership to come to market with some kind of, you know, get a target to do a deal. So I'm curious, because we got to talk about the risks here. Um, and of course, I didn't do a disclaimer, but we're not getting any, you know, financial advice. This is traded to your own risk. We're trying to, you know, navigate through this very uh, rapid current of, um, of, of offerings and you know, financial products that are coming to market that are both tradable and investable. And one thing that I wanna definitely talk about are the risks, George, and in particular, I mean, and taking any private company is uncertain, um, no question. And it, it can be a huge success or crashing you know, failure, but this uncertainty, if you will, of just writing a check to do a deal um, even makes it to, to a layperson even more wrought with risk. And oftentimes there's this you know, misconception as well that a SPAC raises money in, an, in a SPAC IPO and then uses it later in a SPAC merger to take a company public. But in fact, uh, most of them, I, I read two thirds of the IPO pro proceeds are returned to shareholders and a new equity is raised at the time of the merger. A little bit um, uh, risk of dilution or redemptions. Can you talk to that kind of mechanic um, of mitigating risks for the investors? So, certainly, so there are a lot of structural issues in, in all of the points you just touched on. The, the fundamental basis of a SPAC is that it's a cash pool sitting in treasuries uh, that no one touches between the IPO and the business combination. So the, so the effective risk and the effective exposure historically, as far back as, as the first SPAC um, in, in 2003 and four, um, has been treasury exposure, US treasuries, not just US treasuries, but since the credit crisis, um, only short-term duration. So three and six and even shorter paper. And, and when people talk about SPACs being effectively riskless, that's what they mean. Because the equity that you buy as an investor, whether, whether retail or institution, um, is the same. It is, it is a, the right to a piece of a trust account that is, that is sitting untouched. But that's, that's the risk mitigator. That's the downside protection. That's, um, that's where it's a treasury alternative. In almost every IPO, um, the SPACs are issued along with additional securities, usually in the form of warrants. Mm -hmm. And those warrants effectively have option value. So they have 
um, they're, they're traded uh, at, on the probability of a team finding an interesting target, something that the market might, might appreciate, uh, and being able to price the merger with that target at a valuation below that of which the, the market will, will hold it, which, is, which explains a lot, of the, a lot of the alpha generation on these announcements that's happened predominantly in the past couple of years. We, it's not traditional for these uh, for announcements to be immediately followed by, or in some cases these days, uh, upon rumor preceded by actual price appreciation. That's they're, new. they're front that's running point. this. I mean, they are very excited about this magic that's being created. So, but there are obviously um, caveats. I mean, the, the warrant costs nothing, it, but it's worth something. That that's appealing, yeah. um, and definitely this you know the value of the warrant. Uh, how did I, uh, I guess the option to buy a share of stock in the future for a fixed price and it goes up with the volatility of the underlying. So yeah. I like that concept because I'm a volatility trader. So I understand that, you know, increasing IV or implied volatility um, when, the, when the price changes in the underlying. So that's been happening a lot though in some of these, uh, these SPACs. I mean, I put together a watch list of 198 just a watch list on January 7th. Okay, not that long ago. We're talking, it's the 14th, right? 91% <laughs> are green, okay? And most of them by double digits and a few of them triple digits, like 100, 200%. So that's outsized in just one week. So we've got a little media going on right here in this space. What is your, you know, your um, your feel for, and, and Craig as well, for this continuing in 2021, because it's getting a lot of attention now and sharks are going into the water, no question, to feed on this momentum. Any caveats, any, any you know, anything that you, you see that was uh, for the space that needs to be looked out, you know, looks to be, needs to be monitored. Let's just put it that way. I mean, from, from my perspective, I think the SPAC, the IPO, you have to be conscientious of the market in general, right? If, if the market turns down, the SPAC market will similarly turn down. I think the euphoria now is built on some of these serial SPACers like Chama. Mm -hmm and others who seem to have the magic touch and people are attracted to instant gains, right? So it's always gonna attract the degenerate gambler who now believes that all they have to do is buy a SPAC. With the name double, Chamath. Double yeah. or triple their money. Well, the reality is I don't care if the name is Chamath or whomever, nobody bats a thousand nobody bats a hundred percent in this game we all if you've been around you're going to have bruises ultimately we're paper pushers dependent upon the company to perform and and one of the risks right now from my perspective is there's nearly 400 SPACs chasing targets there are 400 not, chasing targets and how many are targets not, are really that exciting <laughs> well that's the issue there are not necessarily 400 names ready to be public. And there's a lot of speculation about which SPAC can do the deal. I mean, get, get, get them interested in that particular. So it comes down to the big get bigger. It's the celebrity CEOs have the, have the sponsorship. That's right. But with that said, it's still important to understand valuation overall and make your investment decision based on historical metrics such as price to sales, which at least for the time being is out the window. You know, I, I've been doing this 26 years. I don't recall even in 2000 where mature companies traded 20, 30, 40 plus times revenue, right? In this plus, cycle, plus, you have plus. snow, <laughs> yeah. you have snow in the stratosphere. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not sure who owns it and why I get it. I trade a lot. I see all these momentum names. I have them all on my screen. But you asked about investments versus trading. 
I do those because are, those you are don't trades. even know. I don't see that as an investment. Now, my SPAC strategy is real simple. Buy it, do the homework ahead of time. You've got great resources, SPAC track, Renaissance Capital, IPO Scoop. There's lots of, of, of sources, resources whereby you can obtain names and symbols, go to sec.gov, read the S1 and be prepared. That's what I do. And that's what I think everybody is capable of similarly doing. Buy the unit as close to 10 as possible. In this cycle, you know, you're buying it now up to 1050 and a little higher. I've, I've recently broken some rules just because I want what I call a stub. I want a, a foot in the name. In the event they do a quick deal, and if not, it'll drift lower and I'll buy more. Um, you know, CCIV, which recently is, uh, there's a lot of speculation surrounding that, that symbol and a merger with Lucid. Uh, it wasn't long ago I, I had bought the stock. Tesla at, competitor. At $10.05 for the unit, and it was trading in the nines. And I was a little aggravated, but it's just a strategy. You know, I, I try not to look at these. And then suddenly the unit, I think it's uh, in real time, it's 1850, having hit 21. So are you still long? I sold a lot of it uh, today and I have a stub. Okay. If, if they complete the deal, if, if uh, the rumors are true, I'll probably be back. I'm curious to know, uh, you know, there's speculation that it's, at ten dollars, it would be a fifteen billion dollar transaction. So at twenty, it's a it's a thirty billion. However, in this market, you know, market cap doesn't seem to matter. Can it go to 40, 50 billion? If it's truly a viable Tesla competitor, which which I've done additional diligence and and it looks to be second to most behind Rivian, which I, I think is not going to do merge with a SPAC, but can it go to 30, 40? Absolutely. Can it go to 15 in a bear market, 10? Possibly. You know, I, I don't know. My, m the way I operate is I buy right. And if I miss a name, I miss it. I, I don't care. I don't think about it. There's thousands of names. There's thousands of opportunities. The casino is open every single day. So, so what about the... And what about the deals that like Visa, um, you know, had previously announced they were going to acquire Plaid for 5.3 billion and the deal was terminated. This is a target. Now everyone's on it. Who, where do you put your money with the expectation that they could secure that deal, which is a big, you know, opportunity, if you will. You know, I'm not smart enough to guess which of the 400 is going to Nail Plaid, Chamath tweeted, we know he likes it. Um, there's, there's lots of um, SPACs that are focused on, on financial service, fin, twin and insure tech space. Yeah. Any of them can grab it, I don't know. So there's, there's you know, for most people, there, there seems to be two options. Spread the risk amongst many names. Mm-hmm or be concentrated. And it, again, I can't tell anybody what they're, how to manage their finances and what they're looking to do. I know when I was a lot younger, I took very concentrated bets. Now no, you spread I, them spread, out. I spread out. I mean, I, okay. I'm not, I don't care. I don't need to build wealth. I need to preserve it. So George, it's, no, yeah. no, it's a, a comment in chat that that's a very similar approach to another attendee. Um, George, can you give a little bit of background? Um, Cause I didn't do probably um, fair duty there in explaining your sponsorship role in bringing these to market. And I'm not sure if you can say which ones they are active for the firm, but, um, and let me know where I, you know, can get some information in this regard and where it's not. Um, but I would like to know a little bit more of like, where do you put your your dollars? Sure. Uh, so, Shorten is a bit unique in that, uh, as as Craig highlighted, our first um, interaction with SPACs was as a SPAC sponsor, and we um, sponsored the third ever SPAC. It was the first cross-border SPAC, and 
uh, it was focused at the time on China, which was essentially unknown to um, mm -hmm. US equity capital markets, certainly for main board listings. Um, and we were making use of the SPAC the same, the same method that sponsors are using it today. It was just an unknown path. And so um, a lot of the infrastructure didn't exist and the strategies weren't in place. And so a lot of that had to be innovated. Ultimately merged with a uh, PRC based ag company run by a uh, uh, run by a, a scientist who had uh, trained and uh, built his ideas here in the US. And it was extremely successful and followed that up with two additional SPACs, again, sponsored. Um, each was more successful than the prior and we ultimately became underwriters and advisors based on, based on that experience. And um, so over the years have become one of the mo most active underwriters of these things and also m and advisors um, and continue to sponsor. Um, I'm currently the director and CFO of Chardon Healthcare Acquisitions 2, which is our second healthcare SPAC focused primarily on uh, disruptive biotech. Um, That's our, a very big one with oncology and CRISPR and, la, and the rest. Sure, the, the, mm -hmm. space is, the space is interesting for SPACs. SPACs bring, as I said, they bring a little bit of something to everybody. There's a use case in, in many cases uh, that's applicable to multiple sectors and multiple types of companies. But ultimately, um, from a from a deal making perspective, SPACs are interesting because they're extremely flexible. They're essentially fungible, and you guys touched earlier on the concept that um, backing the hot hand or or the big name has been a successful strategy. That's true, because the vehicle themselves. Uh, are, are not particularly different from one to another. No, ultimately, the leadership they, and the targets, they matter. <laughs> the leadership matters quite a bit and mm -hmm. ultimately the target matters more than anything else. And so I think Craig was, Craig was rightly saying, and, and he's, he's as, as experienced investor as any could be, at the end of the day, the decision to, to hold us back if you already do, or to purchase any of the securities, either the common or the, the warrants as in most cases, it needs to be based on the view of whether the proposed transaction, not just the name of the target, but also the valuation at which it's being done, represents value. Mm -hmm. Is it being done at a discount? And the proxy for that over the last year was, um, was whether the deal was anchored by, more often than not by a pipe, uh, anchored mm -hmm. by one of the top institutions. And Fidelity has become a um, synonymous with a pipe anchor just in the okay. last nine months. Um, and I think a lot of investors are, are um, um, potentially doing a little bit less diligence than they might otherwise do if they see that Fidelity is, a, is an anchor uh, of a pipe. Mm -hmm. That's been a successful strategy. But ultimately, in a down market, as we've seen, we've, we've been through the, the credit crisis and SPACs had uh, predictable success rates in, in a market where it was fully risk off. Um, uh, ultimately, the, the business combination through announcement and the, success, the surviving company after the business combination will trade according to market sentiment and underlying company performance. So getting back to some of the risks that you were highlighting, buying um, indiscriminately um, and irrespective of valuation has not been a successful strategy across the board. And, um, and more recently, we are starting to see a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit of a market pause on announcements and rumors. Just this past week, there have been a number, I won't name names, but there have been a number of announced deals, a number of rumors. Some have traded extremely well, some have not. And an indiscriminate buying strategy that probably worked fairly regularly for the past nine months was working about 50% uh, this, this week. And I think that's, that's probably healthy. Yeah, I'll jump in, I think, because uh, I can name names. So FST today, Fast was Act was FST, Frank, okay. Sam, Tom. You know, there was a rumor that uh, Fertitta, who also has a SPAC, LCYAU, uh, but that uh, FST is talking to Fertitta the 
the common uh, pop from about 1040 to 1250 and then settled back to 1080 and now it's about 1150. It's all over the place. Um, you know, again, people think uh, to George's comment, George's comment about buying indiscriminately, people think a SPAC is a no-brainer and, and riskless. Well, let me cite a few ID, ticker ID. Um, what was it again? India dog ID. Got it, okay. As soon as the deal closed, it, it plunged from 10 to 470. Uh, that, that one, they compete with parts, PRTS. It's actually bigger. Uh, I think it, in the fours, I was a buyer. Then it ran to 10 in one day. I don't know why, but I sold all of it. And then it dropped back to, I think, the uh, fives, and I started buying it back. Um, ATNF, Apple, Tom, Nancy, Frank, that deal closed, and it went straight uh, down to $1.90. Whoa. So you can get crushed. There, there's a SPAC out there, DCRB, Decarbonization Plus. This unit has been bid up from uh, 10 to 1338. This management team, this is their fourth deal. Their three other deals were AMR, Apple, Mary Romeo, it's bankrupt, fast, uh, VIST. You might have to put those in, it, it, that's okay, um, in chat, I'm not catching them all. <laughs> It was the, the three prior deals, AMR, VIST, and CDEV. All three of them, if you owned it at 10, you're down about 80% uh, investing in this team. So there's a lot of speculation surrounding DCRB. Maybe the fourth time will be the charm. I bought units uh, when they came public and I flipped out of them. I, I don't know this team and I'm not betting on guys that have uh, are down 80% across their, their SPAC portfolio. All right, um, so those are those are no bueno, you're not touching oh, those. No, 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 but I'm, I'm highlighting that the sector has significant risk mm -hmm. to buying indiscriminately. Know what you're buying and, and it's not only for SPAC, it's for every, any investment you make. I'm having a few, uh, George, um, questions here on the biotech SPAC that you were uh, discussing, referencing. Do you have a ticker for that? Sure. So the, it's and, and it's trading as a SPAC. So it has not announced a business combination. Um, and the, the ticker is CHAQ. CHAQ? Correct. Okay. Now the stock's around $10.50. Now, interestingly, this is Chardon Healthcare 2. George, are you able to comment on uh, there was a one? There was a one, and I'm, I'm not able to comment on. Uh, on specific transactions. Okay, so specifically, um, targets obviously are the subject of much of the speculation, and then um, choosing your, you know, leader, if you will, and the strategy of getting that deal done. Are there, and of course, some don't work. This is this is all part of the market. What do you uh, right now see as the most exciting acquisition targets. Plaid is one that's referenced because it has so many tentacles in the FinTech, I mean, and payment, Venmo, Sophie, the rest. Um, what are some of the, the hottest targets right now being sought after for both gentlemen? Yeah, um, you can go to the, what is it? The CNBC Disruptor 50 list. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really look at it that way because for me, I'm buying SPACs, again, based as an alternative to, to treasuries. I'm buying them as close to $10 as possible. And I have no, I mean, there's hundreds of great companies. Yeah, there's a lot of hype, Stripe, and now Plaid, uh, yeah. and, and Lucid, and Rivian. And, you know, I think the reality is many of the, the deals that have been announced have never, nobody's ever heard of them, e even... Uh, uh, you know, desktop metals and, you know, Chamath came out with, with the MP materials, MP. Well, you know, I've been around a long time and, and that's a company that's been in bankruptcy multiple times. And suddenly it's back with a great story because of 
rare you know, earth. knees and rare earth and yes. blah, blah, blah. And, you know, who knows? For me, okay. I owned it. I traded it. I'm not investing because for, I just have no idea. I know the history. It was Molly Corp. And that was a super hot deal. And it went straight from, I think, 80, 90, 100 to zero. Yeah. I, I don't care. Chamath is an investor. He's a, he's a paper pusher like me and all of us. It's very different than an operator having an, a, an asset that you can grow. This is it, a mine. There's a lot of different it variables. Does, it does feel like a, a zero to hero kind of, of play. Yeah. So. And, and, and another variable that, that most people don't think about, right? Because we're here buying SPACs at $10, units at 10 But the founders of these vehicles are buying millions of shares. Read the prospectus for $25,000 for five, 10 plus million shares. Their basis is 0. 0.0005. Their goal is to close a deal. Our goal is to profit from deal close going forward. Our interests are not necessarily aligned. Okay. People have to be aware of that. And uh, John is asking a good question in chat as well. Any thoughts about units versus warrants versus shares? Um, you know, any arbitrage from this pricing? Again, I think this is more um, kind of a, a retail focus than big money focus as far as institutional placement. But how do retail investors and traders position if they believe in one of these, you know, acquisition targets and... Uh, and SPACs, what's, what's the best approach? George, you want to take that? I mean, I, I have a lot of thoughts. Sure, so but, but yeah. in terms of, in, in terms of um, maybe I'll start it this way. The vast majority of SPAC, institutional SPAC investors leading up into um, late 2020 um, are credit ARB, risk ARB, um, traditional investors. They, if there is an institutional scale arbitrage available, they are arbing. Mm -hmm. Buying units, potentially selling warrants in common ahead of the split, meaning ahead of their own splitting of them. Um, and those arbitrages are usually uh, priced out at scale. So that doesn't mean that the, they don't exist because there are a lot of these. Not everybody's going to catch them. And there can be opportunities on a day-to-day -day basis to capture five cents here and there, but usually not at scale. Um, other than that, the math is the math. A unit is comprised of the two components. If they get out of whack, somebody will, will arb it. Um, and the only other element to it is that it's, it's important to note if you look at the data and you, and you track the actual trading um, trends for warrants specifically. SPAC warrants are not options. They don't trade like European options. They can't be priced like them. There's a wall of probability that stands between them and a, uh, and a status potentially more as an option. And that's called the business combination. And so you have to multiply the, the standard model by the probability of a deal close and the other market dynamics that exist in the interim. I think a lot of people get that wrong, and we've seen a lot of risk taken, um, even by some of the more, let's say, experienced, but maybe not studied investors, feeling like they should trade exactly like an option where they don't. Okay, so then Craig, how do you approach it? Units, warrants, stocks? So again, uh, the choice is one, a function of your wallet, and two, a function of risk. Buying the unit closest to IPO is the least risk. Similarly, it's the least reward. You can wait for the unit to split. And historically, you had a pretty good shot to buy warrants under a buck. So for example, on uh, HPX, Harry Paul X-Ray, it's a name I've talked about many times on, on Twitter. It's a, a management team run by Bernardo Heese, who is a partner at 3G. He's a former CEO of Kraft Heinz and Burger King. This is a guy I'm betting on. I mean, 3G is one of the largest PE firms in the world. 
He's done deals with Warren Buffett. These, these warrants were, I was buying them, I think 60, 70 cents. I was buying units under $10. So to me, there was zero risk. So um, this is uh, a few months ago, SPACs weren't in favor like they are today. Um, the other side of that is, is uh, a SPAC Rogers Silicon Valley, or you've got the altimeter SPACs where the warrants are trading four, five, six dollars. I think the Rivet, the Leap, uh, was it Rivet? Capital guys, Leap. Uh, those warrants are trading at five dollars. It's all about risk reward, you know. To me, I want to see the deal before I'm taking that kind of risk. If, if people don't like the deal, those warrants will go from five, six dollars straight to two. You're down 50, 60, 70 percent. So, again, for me, I do the work ahead of time. I'm buying units, and at the time they separate the unit, on a lot of these deals, the commons trading 10 and a quarter, 10, 50, 11. You can sell your common and, and essentially. You've not only captured four, five, six percent in the common, but you now have a free warrant and forget it. You can build a portfolio of free warrants and see what happens. All for, right. For, so the, for the average Joe, you know, maybe you're new to the game, you don't have a ton of money. You can just buy a warrant portfolio and you're going to have some grand slams like QS, former KCACW. Those warrants went to $40, $40. I think the Nikola warrants went to the moon. You know, these are huge moves that offset a lot of bust two to one or, or whatever. What about the pros prospects of a SPAC ETF, like SPCX? It's a great way for, for people to participate and in, in own all of them if you don't have the capital to buy them all. I mean, basically that's what I do. I run my own SPAC ETF. In and essence, by buying all these deals and, and spreading risk. And what are the, if you could type into chat, all panelists and attendees, what are the ones that you are spying most right now? Like eyes on the prize, the tickers of the ones that you are looking at for 2021. Is that a question for me? I'm having a little lag, so sometimes you're going away. That's why I can't quite make it out. What'd you say? Are you asking me or people are typing in chat? Yes, yes. I didn't hear you. No, you. <laughs> um, what are you looking at? Uh, I know it can change, no question, but what are you right now? Highest probability. Um, I mean, yeah. Tickers so in chat. ACTC, with I mean, Arc Arclight was a name that, that I was had high expectations and, and they announced a deal uh, a few days ago and, and the common went from 10 to, to 25 and the unit from, uh, let's see, it hit 32 today. So cross that one off the list. Which one was it? Uh, that was Arclight, ACTC. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's a deal that came, the, uh, I think yesterday, SWET, it's backed by a, host of billionaires looking for um, a target in the, in the health and fitness space. I think going forward, that could be a same. TJ Rogers has a SPAC, um, Rogers acquisition. I mean, he's a brilliant guy, former uh, founder okay. of Cypress Semi and spun out mm -hmm. uh, SunPower, TJ Rogers. Um, I mean, the, the list of good management teams right now is, is, is really endless. I mean, it's- Okay, it's, so it, this is, um, it changes obviously for you. I just wanted to get kind of a short list. And George, you, um, besides CHAQ, are there others that you're involved in? Uh, there are, and unfortunately I'm not, I'm not- a, Okay, a that, yeah. Okay, um, PSTH, we're being asked about. Any comments on that one, PSTH? You know, Bill Agman is, is a controversial investor. I'm long from the 22s. I'm betting with him. I have no idea what he's going to buy, but he's a smart person. And whether you like him or hate him, I'm not here to love anybody. I'm here to find names that can appreciate 
and profit. And he's got he's got four billion dollars of cash, and he's going to find something really good. Okay. How about PHIC? You had mentioned that one on Twitter. Which one? PHIC. And by the way, Craig's Twitter handle is at San Diego Sam. You know, PHIC. It's it's backed by the. Uh, the founder of Medicine Company and the former chairman and CEO of Pfizer. Oh, these guys clearly know every single yeah, healthcare that's... opportunity in the in the world. Again, I'm betting on people. I'm betting on teams. There is no doubt that they will find something. Again, the risk. Do they find a deal that I like? I have no idea. So again, you buy right, you buy early. I'm not here to, to follow people on Twitter that are buying for nickels and dimes and quarters and they jump in and they jump out. I, I don't know how you make money that way over time. It's, well, everyone has a, you know lots of ways to make money. The trick is not to lose it. So you have some hot hand this past year um, since you know actively posting your thoughts on these SPACs. And then, um, and I know some you're out of completely like, I, I don't even remember the, the list of names because you do go in and out. You well, well, rise it up, yeah. you do your, huh? QS, I'm out of completely. That's QuantumScape. I, I wrote it from 10. I sold the last of my common over 100. I posted it. I think it was 105. Gone. Yep. Will I come back at the right price? Sure. Do I want to see, you know, again, a lot of these SPACs are being sold on 20, 25 and beyond numbers. Something to be aware of. The second the market turns down, no institutional investor will care about 2025 and beyond. They will care about 2021 and 2022. So, okay. yeah. It's forward looking always and pulling that forward. So um, a few questions I wanna make sure um, the attendees in chat get uh, heard and either gentlemen answer. Um, one, if Al is asking, can you please compare buying a SPAC on IPO day and selling during the first week versus doing the same strategy in a regular IPO? Who wants to take that? Uh, buying a SPAC in the first week? I mean, there's, there's the potential that it won't move at all, right? These things came public at 10, 10, they, they opened at $10 and 10 cents and sat dead for days and weeks and months, and maybe years. A traditional IPO in this tape opens at 100 plus percent premium. You can buy that and lose money real fast. You can buy that and make money real fast. Depends on where you enter. You know, buying SPACs to flip an IPO, that's, that's talk that I don't like to hear because that's typically end of cycle talk. It's not that easy, right? Um, All right. So I think it's more fun to buy a traditional IPO like a firm, you know, went public yesterday. It opened in the 90s and today it went straight to 138 before crashing to 108. So if you like that type of, of game, play it. Are you um, ACTA? I think it is. I don't have it right in front of me. Uh, ACTC maybe? TC, thank you. Huge. Yeah, I, that was a that was a name I was planning to mention. I, I owned a lot of it. It's a team that, again, you you can't bet against the team. They were John Hancock Energy Infrastructure Infrastructure guys. They'd invested uh, twenty three billion dollars in one hundred and ten platforms prior to uh, doing this most recent transaction uh, with Proterra. Uh, to be honest, I sold. Uh, I owned units at 10 and I'm gone, sold them. Okay, so I, I, won't, I think I only grabbed about, but you're out of that one. Sold, yes. Okay, I got four of them. The, 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 the risk word for me is no longer there. Like I'm not interested in. Okay, in any of the, the Chama, you know, the IPOE, F, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I mean, this is all the rage because it's so high profile. Do you, any play in those? I'm long IPOE. Uh, I've owned it um, since since uh, it was introduced in the 11s and 12s. I own IPOF at $11. I'm just looking at $11.27. I own IPOD. Again, these are all units in the 
basis 1148. I own them all. Whether okay. I'll keep them, I don't know. Um, the altimeter, Brad, uh, altimeter, that uh, wasn't a Brad Turner, AGCB, there's no warrant. The common uh, is about 13 right now, AGCU. I definitely would be long, though the guy's a rock star. He you will said AGCB, find correct? AGCB and AGCUU. I'm long them. His track record is impeccable. I suspect he'll do something pretty good. You've got, you know, you've got uh, the Reed Hoffman from LinkedIn, reInvent Technology Partners, RTP.U, RTPZ.U, his second one. He's a very smart VC. I, I, my bet is he comes up with something pretty good. You've got SPNV, Supernova Partners. You know, this is another uh, guy from Zillow, uh, Spencer Ras Raskoff. He's a smart guy. I'm betting with him. You know, PIPP, I sold most, uh, I actually sold all of it today. Um, that's John Thane, you know, he's a former Merrill guy. You got to bet with him. It's 16 or 1550, you know, it's, it's too much of a premium. I, I just stick to my discipline. Can I All come right. back? Absolutely. I want to see a deal. Okay. What about the DMYI question? So, yep. So those guys have had two great ones. I'm in, I'm in it. Uh, I think they had DMYD and DMYT. One, one was, uh, sorry, my phone was ringing. One was uh, Russ Street and the other Genius Sports. So it's a good bet that these guys know where to look and, and I'm long the name. Long both? Uh, I'm long DMYI. The other two have already announced and no, I'm gone from both of those. Got it. What else is in here that they're asking? Because the questions are coming in. I don't know if you could resources. Um, oh no, first let me go back. Do you have a right price for QS? You know, QS, if, if their battery scales, my target was about 200. I think I posted on Twitter. I, I didn't expect the unit to hit 200, you know, a month after the deal. So now it, it's either a zero or it's a grand slam. I have okay. no idea. It's, it's too far into the future. You know, Toyota has a solid state battery. And uh, I read recently that they intend to introduce cars built with their batteries uh, maybe this year or next year. So QuantumScape isn't the only guy in solid state. How about ACAC? Uh, let me look at my cheat sheet. Uh, ACAC. That's from Darren. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this name, uh, it's a guy from uh, MGM and you know, it's, it's another one that these guys know the game and I'm sure they'll find something. Is it, is it going to be good? I, I have no idea. It's not a big bet of mine, but it's in my, it's in my wheelhouse. Okay. My, my, one of my bigger bets, you know, VCVC stocks uh, moved up recently. Um, it's called 10 X. Um, 10X Capital Ventures, you know, this is an 18 month SPAC, which is attractive. The investors here have been involved in, in endless grand slams from Palantir to Robin Hood to DraftKings. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt these guys are connected. I'm betting that, that they'll use their, their uh, base to find presumably uh, something pretty sexy. What about a pot SPAC? SBVCF, there are a whole bunch of them. I don't have my. You know, there's. Open. You know, I know pot's hot. I, I owned uh, Weed Maps. I sold it after the deal. Um, I'm not huge in this sector, but I know that there's a lot of excitement surrounding it. Roche and uh, THBR, R-O-C-H and T-H. Yeah, so, so, so Roche was, uh, was Roth Capital's first deal. Um, you know, Roth is, is very connected 
in the in the mid to you know 500 million to a couple billion market cap space. They historically have a, a conference that's second to none annually in Laguna. Um, they have another SPAC ROCCU, which priced recently, and I know they followed for a third. Again, I bought a lot of it. I, I tweeted on it at, in the low tens. It's now 11. And, and if there's, again, some of these guys, are, they're like them or hate them, but they know how to get deals done and they know what Wall Street is looking for. They've been around forever. What about GHIV? Uh, GHIV, I know, is a name I, I see go by all the time on, uh, on Twitter. Um, it's not a name that I own. And uh, I think it's Agora Steel. Yeah, United Wholesale Mortgage. Um, I like Goris, but the mortgage space is, is not for me. How about TDAC? Like Lottery.com, TDAC. It's another one. It's, it's, it's speculative, and I'm not a speculator. I don't know. I haven't seen the metrics on this deal, and therefore I can't comment. Um, SOAC? Again, uh, it's, there's, there's a lot of expectation built in here. The stock has done, has done well, and people are expecting them to announce something pretty much any day. I think FUSC, people are similarly expecting an announcement almost any day. Uh, whether did you they say do EO, did you, uh, Sorry, did you comment on EOSC? No, I said FUSE. Oh, FUSE. Yes, yes, yes. They, okay. These are, you know, Twitter names that, that yep. are getting a lot of play. SOAC, throw that in the mix with FUSC. Yep. And uh, another one, BTAQ, I see all the time. I am long BTAQ. I was going to say for the plaid potential. You know, this guy, uh, yeah, he, he bombed with the acquisition of autonomy, but he's a deal maker. He's a rock star. And like I said, if, if you've been successful, even VCs have lots of failed deals. It's the winners that we hear about. We don't hear about, you know, the nine losers for the one grand slam. George, any comments on uh, structurally some questions in here? How and when does the unit separate into common and warrants? What to look out for there? There used to be a convention of, of separating it at uh, 90 days, and that was shortened ultimately to closer to 30 days. But at the end of the day, most teams and underwriters have the right to pick a separation date um, by convention about out to 52 days, but there's no hard and fast rule. There is a bit of a movement, um, partly just because of all of the um, mechanics involved in all SPACs and to institutionalize a, a specific date uh, so that all SPACs split on the same day. And um, that may happen. But as it stands today, um, it's impossible to know without knowing uh, what's in the underwriters and uh, and teams discussions, which specific day it'll split. And this is just kind of a general comment and I definitely, definitely want both of your feedback. I know there are tons of SPACs that keep coming into chat to comment on and you are awesome to give us the bullet <laughs> machine gun fire rapid response, Craig. But I do want to ask one question, which is on the negative side for sure, which is, there was a ticker that came out, you know, LMFOA, which is um, kind of playing with this euphoric run. The, the comment is more along the lines of you got a new smack, uh, laughing your, you know, A off. And then this is just kind of fodder for the doom loop um, players that are saying this is the euphoric 2000 equivalent. Hmm. What do, you, what do you both say to that? Because it is a bubble that's, uh, in other words, um, pointed to reason for this euphoria that will you know, not end well. And then th that was the perfect example of naming a SPAC kind of in your face, if you will, just to epitomize the, um, that, uh, that sentiment. Any comments that's giving uh, you know, the, the doom loopers that uh, ammunition to say you got 400 SPACs, empty shell, no, too, too few deals, too much money. It's not going it, to, it, it's just, it's too, it's too much like 2000. Yeah. So, so 
it's it's not like 2000 in 2000 you, it was an ipo game companies with nothing were trading for four or five 10 15 20 billion dollars a spac prices at 10 typically opens at 10 50 10 60 so your risk is five percent if you buy right you can do really well regardless of whether we're in a bubble or not uh the market, for sure, there's a lot of froth, and it's as speculative as I've ever seen it. And and the only other time I've I've seen it like this is 2000. Um, but again, if you buy the right teams at the right price, I think you'll do really well. Yes, there's there's too much supply, and it's not good in the short run, but. All of these deals, these, these higher profile deals, Open Door, DraftKings, everything Chamath, which Open Door is one of them, Altimeter, uh, Reed Hoffman, it absolutely has validated what George has worked on for close to 20 years. I know 20 years ago, you had to educate people, and, and a SPAC was, you know, foreign. People didn't understand, and, and it could take maybe three, four, five, six months a year for people to understand it. Now they get it. It's a great alternative for all of us. You know, who wants to buy a firm, for example, pricing it at 40 or wherever price and opens it close to 100. The SPAC gives us a great opportunity to participate in, in the upside. And it's, it's a much better vehicle for multiple reasons. It also has a built-in in financing with the warrant that a traditional IPO doesn't have. So from my perspective, be smart, be selective, don't buy indiscriminately, have a strategy to, to spread risk amongst teams. And these teams will return significant value. I think last year, George, if, if you bought a basket of SPACs, the return was what, 30%? Yeah, based off of the announced deals. Based off the announced deals. <clears throat> so, you know, there's, there's again, uh, I see in chat, somebody asked about NOAC. It's a, it's, it happens to be a shard deal, so I know George can't comment, but it's in the right space, plant-based foods. It's super hot. It's got great management team. Uh, one, of, one of the leads on this team is invested in 60 plant-based food and beverage companies. He obviously knows the space. He's got, he's got 60 irons in the fire already. You know, it's a, it's a place that you want to be. Um, unfortunately it's, it's up to 11. So now your risk is 10% down and, and maybe 50, a hundred, 500% up. Who, who knows? I don't know, but it, you know, it's one that you want to bet on. Uh, so Janet asked those questions and NVVNX as well. I'm sorry, which one? NVVNX. NVVNX, I don't, I don't know that. Okay. It's NOAC is, is the ticker. Um, somebody wrote CLU, I own it. Um, and I think this is uh, Brad, somebody's back. Let me pull up my sheet. Um, but, you know, again, this is a guy that, that uh, I think Brad, uh, Brad Feld, you know, smart, well-respected guy. I think you want to bet on him. This is C-R-U-U, correct? Uh, no, this I think is C something. Uh, I have so many of these. Um, C-R-U. Oh, just, oh, yeah. Okay, so C-R-U. C-R-U. Mm -hmm. What about... Brad Feld. Got it. Um, being asked about uh, CLII and rice. Uh, this one, uh, climate change, is one I think I mentioned. Again, it's it's got a significant uh, premium built in, and there's substantial uh, following. These these are the NRG guys, Credit Suisse deal. Um, it price September 29th. I own it and uh, in my notes, I wrote strong management, clean energy focus, energy guys. Which one is this? You know, this, this is uh, climate change, uh, oh. crisis, real impact. Okay. 
C L I I. You know, there, there's one other caveat here, and, and we've all been really, really spoiled. Historically, deals are not floating, i.e., the IPO and then and then a target announcement within two, three, four months. I think TPGY uh, recently announced a deal in maybe record time, um, a couple of months. If if deal flow slows, units will begin to drift down. People will get frustrated. People will get fed up. That's when the warrant premium deteriorates really quickly. And that's the opportunity for everybody participating on this call to build their shop, you know, what I call a shopping list and have your list ready. You can leave out good till canceled orders. I mean, there's a lot of sloppy trading across the board where people just hit the market sell button and boom, suddenly you get sprayed. You don't, you don't even know you're long until you look at, at your uh, holdings at the end of the day and you say, oh, when did I get that, you know? So it's what I do. I frequently put bids below the market, offers above the market. Well, what about the ones uh, being asked about Faraday and future merging with PSAC? You know, this is a, this is another rumor. It's it's got a, a an incredibly tainted history, which perhaps explains why it's not at fifteen, uh, like CCIV. But if the metrics on that deal are promising. I suspect that this deal will be significantly higher. Uh, I spent some time on their website. You know, this is a company that it seems like all the bad news is behind them. The, the founder reorganized in bankruptcy. They've got nearly 900 patents. They've invested over a billion dollars to date. They have a factory. They just did a deal in China. I don't know the metrics, but I, I found that uh, on a simple Google search. It sounds like it could be quite interesting, but until the deal is formalized and you know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be property solutions versus another SPAC. I, I see the same headlines that everybody else sees. I have no idea. So the uh, NNX was, um, sorry, NVVNX was Australia Lithium, which has been a hot, hot. I don't know it. INAQ, I-N-A-Q. Uh, you know, this is this is another uh, chain deal, uh, Metro Mile. I think it's pretty interesting. Paying for insurance as you go. Mm -hmm. uh, if they scale it to, to include other verticals and it gets real interesting obviously lemonade has been a beast and you have root r-o-o-t which is another name in the space so uh, i like metro mile I, I have other uh hedge fund friends that like it less than me um believing that it's it's more for millennials in the 20 to 30 age group there's a slide in their powerpoint that shows it's also for people over 70 and 80 and above that that don't drive much. So, do you yeah, own it, do you own any of those three? INAC, Root, or Lemonade? Uh, I own INAC. I traded out of Lemonade, and Root is on my due diligence list. So, Lemonade interests me because a while back, um, SoftBank had announced they were, you know, selling Nvidia and buying Lemonade and that kind of thing. And obviously, this is um, doubled from. Uh, of late and it still looks like it had a lot of sponsorship just from historical price action like from a chart standpoint any comments on lemonade since i know that's a popular holding yeah especially I mean, in the Citron, options market citron research bashed it today and and gave it a hundred dollar target and i believe they just did a secondary that they priced at uh, uh what they do 4.5 million at, at uh, 165 so those people are underwater as we speak, you know, look, they're, they're, they're going to do about four or 500 million in revenue and it's got 10 plus billion market cap. It's again, it's, it's, it's outside of a typical market multiple and, and it's names like this that validate that we are in some type of bubble, how high the bubble goes. I have no idea. 
I mean, Tesla's kind of redefined what a bubble can look like. Do you follow unusual option activity um, in any of these that have options trading? No, okay. I'm not an options guy. I think you might be, and I know Malibu investment is, is yeah. pretty good. Yeah, definitely um, just the single stock gamma option flow that is heading into EV and pot stocks and short squeezes, also SPACs. So I'm just curious if you used any of it for your um, you know, trading purposes. But you're answering the question. I mean, I'm an old school manager. I just look at the Stop. metrics I, I study and I don't, this is all noise, you know, options and yeah, okay, it works for a day, a week. But ultimately, if a company is growing over time, I don't care about a weekly option. Well, I am putting your Twitter handle in there because I've been asked a few times and wanted to add that in. This has been, I mean, obviously very helpful, um, structurally speaking, on where to look out for, but um, this bubble, if you will, that uh, many are pointing to as a risk factor for contributing to market weakness in, the, in this new year, um, anything that you just said, if the market pulls back, volatility enters, there's a high likelihood that, you know, first in, first out, for a lot of these SPACs, are there any of them in particular that look per, that look way too over overbought? You know, deals that haven't announced. I mean, I think any unit that's trading in the 14s, 15s, and above. Uh, BTWN comes to mind. I think I sold a bunch of that the other day, over 20 Bridgetown, and and bought it back. Uh, I think in the 15s. Um, you know, that saved me 25%. It's a Peter Thiel deal. He just filed for another one. So I, everybody should be looking out for that deal. You know, I, I do break my rules. So I broke my rule with the South Bank deal. The second it opened, I, I was in it at the opening price, 1185. Yeah, it's above my 1050, but some of these are going to trade at premiums. I want to bet with South Bank. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If, if they do a crappy deal, they'll do a crappy deal. I'm betting they won't. Um, Peter Thiel, another rock star, you know, in this market, I suspect, uh, I think his deal will not have a warrant similar to Gerstner's AGCB, which is his second deal. What was the, what was the prior ticker? Uh, I don't know the ticker, but I know okay. he plowed it. Uh, I saw it either yesterday or the day before. Maybe it's, I know that's better world be whack, but um, I, I don't know. Okay. I'll, I'll post uh, a link to at sec.gov to his second deal. People and, can read it. And, and obviously, um, George, this is helping retail clients that are very active in these names and looking at new um, you know, tickers that are coming to market because there are just so many of late you're definitely more on the invest in institutional side and curious what what are you providing if you will just go back and kind of provide an overview of your services because Craig and I are traders and it's a very different world if you will we can kind of talk about this freely we can get in and out of stuff um, handily it's just not an issue as long as there's liquidity and in the case of QS, there wasn't any. So it was a lovely, you know, long because of no <laughs> inventory for shorts to cover. Don't want to bet against some of these, but um, can you comment on any, first of all, kind of give an overview of where you are in the ecosystem of these deals and how you, uh, how you attract your customer base? Sure. So, so the way the way you guys have been describing your activity in SPACs and the way you trade them is not entirely different from the way the institutions trade them. But the disadvantage that most retail investors have uh, is the inability to be allocated in the IPOs themselves. And you know, Craig highlighted the rule of not not purchasing above 1050. Um, unfortunately, for most, the largest institutions tend to get the lion's share of the, for most retailers, I should say, the largest institutions tend to get the lion's share of the IPO allocations. And as a result, they're, they're in at the treasury value price. And so for them, 
unless treasuries themselves break the buck, um, they have what has historically been zero risk. That doesn't mean that that doesn't mean that the securities themselves can't trade at a discount, which has happened in in extreme drawdowns. But um, the underlying cash value of the security has remained um, consistent and effectively bulletproof. So, as as in my role as an underwriter, um, as all underwriters in SPACs, we're distributing SPAC IPOs to the institutions, and I think we're doing a better job as an industry, including more retail, because there is an advantage to having more, more retail. And the same reason that, that IPOs include retail distribution, um, uh, retail investors are, are valuable, um, are valuable capital um, stack components to any public company. They draw interest to the company. They tend to be, um, they tend to be uh, great cheerleaders for the company, more, more vocal than institutions maybe have Ha, would be or can be, and um, and I think it, it. You know, we have been saying many of us in the industry that it's a shame that SPACs weren't uh, better marketed to retail investors because um, institutions largely have abilities to hedge through various means um, almost any product that they participate in, SPACs included, um, and and sometimes those hedges can be expensive uh, below scale. The, the SPAC structure itself, I think it's it's been it's been um, referenced here quite a bit, but it's still important to clearly articulate. From the IPO, the SPAC is just a, effectively a shell with with a trust behind it, and so until it actually closes a business combination, the downside historically has been limited to the value of the treasury. Um, so for retail investors, that's that's a really good um, that's a really good position. We think. And, and has always been, but it's been dominated by institutions. I think the 2020 has shown us that um, that finally retail had access to the same type of effectively hedged position that institutions have, have had access to for almost 20 years. Mm. So. so are there any macro currents that would change this um, allotment, if you will, of an interest in SPACs, any macro moves that you could kind of point to, whether it be interest rates or the dollar that might uh, cause a significant slowdown in this momentum? The interest rates are probably the key determinant in SPAC pricing and attractiveness to the institutions. Mm -hmm. The, the, yeah, the low to no interest, yeah, the low to no interest rate environment mm -hmm. has clearly driven uh, most of the streets adoption because if they're not making money in their regular way instruments and SPACs underlying instrument being again treasuries aren't also making money but the options have option value the warrants in this case effectively have option value um, so that's a created value but it's but it's mathematically tangible um, and durable they're able to replace their prior strategy with SPAC once interest rates return to some, some um, historically um, meaningful level, the appeal of the SPAC as it's, as it's structured today probably lessens. One of the nice things about SPACs is that their structures change and there are very few things about a SPAC that are actually written in stone. So they'll adapt. And I think, I think they're here to stay in terms of pathways to bringing great companies public. That's been proven. Um, and if the, if the IPO structure has to adapt to a higher interest rate environment. We know it will, we know it has. So how closely do you uh, watch inflation expectations? And uh, I mean, you know, and, and that effect, if you will, on um, corporate bonds, do you, do you care as it relates to this trend reversing and sharply and how it would affect deal flow? It, I think it's, I think it's a really important aspect to what we do on a daily basis. I think people would be surprised um, from month to month how closely SPAC issuance in terms of the actual terms have, um, have paralleled interest rate moves or, or perceived uh, potential interest rate moves. So that's, that's key. Ultimately though, the, the ability of a SPAC to bring value to all constituents comes down to the ability of teams to on average find exciting companies, public ready companies um, 
uh, at good prices. And so the, the, the more important determinant in the, the ability of this project uh, pro, uh, process that we, we're all part of to bring outsized returns is determined by market sentiment. So if we go through a large drawdown for a while, um, that it doesn't have a, a V-shaped recovery as we, as we saw in March of last year, April. Um, we've seen this, we've seen this uh, cycle before and at the top deals still get done, but as public market multiples compress, private market multiple expectations don't fall as quickly and, and uh, it gets harder and harder to convince a private company, most companies that merge with SPACs are private, to combine with a SPAC at a quote unquote discount to some perceived value. And, and that, uh, that trend lasts as long as, as long as the sentiment stays. Um, the challenge there is that SPACs have a limited amount of time two years in most cases these days. And mm. that's been plenty of time to outlast a cycle. Um, but for those SPACs that have unfortunately used up half or more of their allotted time, if wow. the sponsors don't intend to extend them because the markets are um, less liberal, then there is true risk to, the, to those warrants while the shares are still underpinned by treasuries. So it, it, it to me, it's funny, the timing of this um, uh, just absolute floodgate open for all these, you know, SPAC tickers hitting the market and the retail um, excitement in, you know, exploding. At the same time, we have the first time that uh, investment grade corporate bonds are now having a negative real yield, <laughs> first time in history. So yeah. it's kind of like, it's inter interesting that dynamic, if you will, of stats are way up here while you know investment grade corporate bonds are printing a negative uh, real yield. And that just to me is an outlier risk of reversion. Yeah, so well, I, That's something I'm looking at. Um, but again, I can't help but look at the momentum as, as of, of these as trading vehicles, but I can't help but look at that, um, you know, divergence, if you will, the alligator jaws. The, a lot of the capital that, that was previously um, earmarked for different types of credit investments and, and risk of investments tra has transitioned from those into SPACs over the last 18 months and, and at the beginning of this year, even more so. Uh, and that's what's, that's what's provided the capital to support all of this issuance um, already just in the first two weeks of this year. Say that one sentence again. So a lot of the capital that was previously earmarked for different credit strategies, corporates or various other munis or, or, or other ARB strategies was repurposed over the past 18 months to invest in SPACs. That's, that is, that's been the, the, the um, liquidity that's allowed all of these sponsors to, to issue and, um, and, and launch their, their vehicles to go hunt for targets. Got it. When interest rates, when inter, interest rates revert, if they revert, um, a lot of that capital will ultimately be uh, repurpose back to its original use, um, and there will just be less capital. But we're clearly not in an environment, at least not today, and not for the foreseeable future, based on what everyone is expected uh, expecting to hear tonight, in a reduced liquidity environment. That's not where we are, mm -hmm. and um, as long as that's the case, and as long as we don't hear anything um, unexpected out of the Fed equally, SPACs are, for many, a great vehicle to, to maintain, um, you know, a risk-averse positioning with, without, as I said, sacrificing exposure to equity upsides. How, how, what percentage would you say is attributable to uh, pension funds, if at all? Well, it's, 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 it's a good question because, it, as we know, pension funds invest in other funds, and so direct exposure... Uh, has been increasing considerably, but we're also aware that a fair bit of the institutional exposure historically was ultimately managing pension fund capital. Pension funds have been a big part of SPAC growth, um, reinsurance, and um, and some of the larger, again, credit-focused funds um, deciding to 
to transition from other strategies into SPACs, especially this year, uh, in light of the performance from last year. They don't necessarily need to generate 30% um, returns, but we're all aware of various pension obligations needing to meet sort of minimum six and seven percent levels that aren't available as you, as you noted in traditional credit. Uh, SPACs have been generating that that credit, but a lot of that uh, that that yield, but a lot of that yield is has been off of what most would consider to be more speculative valuations okay. for growth companies. And as a, and as a segment, how did they perform in March, February, March in our you know downdraft, if you will, our thirty five percent. Now that's a great question because just that period, just the 35% crash, yeah. how did they perform right then and there? Did you hold your breath for 35 days? Because I think no, 33 days from yeah. peak to trough, it was 33 days, 35% down. Where how how was your stomach? Like what was going on? That th there have not been, um, I think fortunately, there have not been very many opportunities for those who understood this product to deploy a lot of capital quickly in the open market, as opposed to um, in IPO allocations. That was one such time when there were opportunities uh, due to uh, fund liquidations to purchase SPAC common at reasonably attractive discounts to their intrinsic value. And in those, in those scenarios, you also see often warrants trading off aggressively because they're the most levered instrument to future, uh, future performance. Okay. And, um, and for those who, who've been active in the, in the space for a long time, that was an opportunity and, and, many, and many took it. Okay, that's, I mean, this has been so helpful and I know we're at like an hour and a half in, but there are so many tickers and so many angles to this and understanding of what, you know, from macro to micro, what makes this, uh, this engine go. I think we should close. It's been an hour and a half and, and I don't want to take your time anymore, but this has been wonderful. And I know it's going to be watched over and over and over again. Thank you for doing your rapid fire um, ticker review, Craig. Thank you very much for the, the institutional perspective as well as the market structure. Um, I definitely have interest in that kind of the macro and then what happens in and risk what happens in periods of risk as it relates to liquidity, because that's what makes the world go round. Um, I think people got a lot out of this. And uh, Craig, share with people where they can find you. George, please do the same. I did put your Twitter handle, um, Craig, but George, I don't, I, I, are you on Twitter? Are you, I don't think you're allowed to be. <laughs> Uh, not, not professionally. <laughs> okay. How, how, do, how do people find you? Should they? <clears throat> They're not going to find George, but they can find me. Okay. Um, well, in general, though. San Diego, Sam. Yep. Uh, I get a lot of private messages. I answer everybody. Yeah, and, you're good. You're all, I have put clients in contact with you as well, because you just, you are active in your due diligence. My goodness. Um, so, and I'm across every single asset, so it's, it's not sitting in, on one, but you have just been hot fire flames this year and also adding tremendous value. Sure that four or five this week alone. It's been crazy. Strong. You're doing awesome. You're feeling good. And George, where can, um, uh, people find you? Because one, they're already saying trying to find you, but could not. So. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, does Sean have a retail arm? George? We don't. And we're, we're an institutional focus investment bank. So people are always welcome to email me. My email address is G Kaufman, K A U F M A N, at chardin.com, C H A R D A N. If I can be of assistance, that's uh, happy to be. Well, I thank you both gentlemen very, very much and appreciate the time, everyone who came in. And yeah, there are folks who couldn't get in today, but there will be um, a, this posted not only on my website at salutetrading.com, but also on my YouTube channel. Lots that I think will be reviewed, especially um, uh, because this is just not going away. In fact, it's probably one of the hotter themes for 2021 as long as interest rates stay low with inflation exp expectations. So to be continued. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. I just wanted to put again, the coordinates right here, if you can find them. And I do offer a guest captain interview 
series on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, this is something where it depends on the topic. It could be an oil trader, a friend of mine who just specializes, uh, and you can't find him on Twitter either, to um, uh, women in finance and trading, which is another uh, theme that I very much like to talk about. I have a Tuesday afternoon, uh, Jonathan Gibbons of Vigtech IO, who I'm pretty sure is in the in this room as well, attending this webinar. Um, we do a macro to micro power hour regarding power structure, regarding market structure and the like. And it's very, very um, action packed, if you will, of what's moving, where we see volatility and rotation and sectors. So definitely, um, if you would uh, check, that, check out the Tuesday, Thursday series, um, YouTube channel is Leduc Trading, as you would imagine. And you can sign up there and get alerted when this video is sent out. And for now, I just want to wish everyone a fabulous uh, 2021 and to keep your eyes on this space. It clearly is just um, making the radar for some, but uh, it, it, it has a lot of juice and a lot of froth. So trade carefully and enjoy your evening. Thank you so much, gentlemen, again. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Samantha. Bye.